good use these days. Now, STS, or sodium tetrodesyl sulfate, uh, is a very expensive compound. You can treat all sized veins with it, um, uh, large and small. And it's uh, twice as strong as, uh, as polydocanol. It has very low allergy potential and uh, it, uh, hyperpigmentation and is a painless uh, solution. Uh, it comes in 1% or 3% biome. Morate sodium, which uh, is a compound that has uh, fatty acids of cod liver oil. It, uh, it kind of developed a bad reputation uh, in the past and uh, does have allergic potential and necrosis and uh, it's slightly weaker than, than polydocanol and you can treat all size vessels. It is uh, legal and uh, a lot less expensive than sotrodeco and it's very good uh, for reticular veins. Now polydocanol, it's, uh, it's another uh, drug that, that's commonly used. It's half as strong as sotrodeco. It's not as expensive. It has low allergy, painless, and it uh, causes less hyperpigmentation and matting. And it's also used in all size veins. <coughs> we use it as an off-label uh, using foam uh, with a sclerosin. <coughs> Now, why do we use uh, foam? And many of you have heard this before in this lecture. Well, uh, when, when you use a sclerosin agent, what you want is the most amount of time a contact with the surfa surfactant with the, uh, with the endothelium so, so you can have uh, um, uh, more um, uh, uh, damage to the endothelium. Um, we usually use a one to four concentration by the physicians and uh, uh, they tend, when, when we use this, we tend to have higher uh, levels of uh, nitrogen uh, that uh, then with the nitrogen you do improve uh, foam stability. However, uh, you cause uh, less soluble in the blood and uh, you have uh, potentially higher side effects when with a higher nitrogen concentration. And uh, also when you use uh, CO2, uh, what you're going to have is a compound that uh, decreases the foam stability and uh, it has rapid uh, foam degradation. And also you get a lot of inconsistencies where you do uh, your solution uh, uh, yourself with, with uh, the three-way syringe, and I'll explain to you why I'm bringing this up uh, now. I want to talk to you about the newer product that um, indicated, and this is not indicated for cosmetic use, but I can see that in the future it will have the potential to use it as a cosmetic. Um, Verithema is uh, actually a compound that was approved in December of 2013. You heard already some of the talks related to it, and uh, it's basically um, a compound that is, uh, comes in a canister with a 65% uh, uh, mix of, uh, of oxygen and then 35% mix of, uh, of carbon dioxide with less than 0.8% nitrogen in it. And um, then they have 1% uh, um, uh, polydocanol, uh, which is the liquid. And it's very, <coughs> very fancy the way they designed uh, the canister to be able to, to uh, 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 form the solution and uh, what what they get is that they get uh, their median size bubble uh, is about 100 micrograms. They didn't get any bubbles that were larger than, than 500 micrograms. And the size of the bubble is very important when you're doing uh, sclerotherapy. Also, uh, the, they, they were able to get a more hom homogeneous uh, 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 compound and uh, coherent and also very uh, echogenic. Now, this is a, a slide showing you the different uh, type of uh, bubbles that you obtain when, when physicians are doing it. Uh, here you can see uh, one with very low density of uh, foam, and then here you get some, some borderline uh, density and, and, and foam in it. And then here you have a lot of bubble, but a lot of liquid that also decreases the effectiveness of, of the vessel. And then here you get the, the varathema uh, with a very good um, density on it in solution. So varathema works as the same uh, damage in the endothelium uh, and leading to um, fibrosis. And uh, this is very important about the trial that they they use and what I want to point out is that they did treat it very small vessels. The smaller were 1.5 millimeters, so this has a potential to be used as a cosmetic. Uh, now the problem that, that I see with Verithema is that they, they actually come in a canister that when, when, you, when you open it, uh, you only have a seven days life. So if you're going to do use it for your cosmetic, you, you need, to, need to be sure that you need to line up all your patients uh, because it is an expensive compound, about $70 per cc. And if you're going to use it, uh, uh, you, you should be able to, uh, it's going to have, it has a, a life uh, only of, of seven days. Now, the interesting thing about when they studied Baristema is that, and you probably heard this uh, during the lectures, is that their, their primary endpoint, when they looked at it, they looked more at uh, patient satisfactions and quality of life. Uh, most of the studies that we've done in vain so far have been looking at ultrasound results. And um, uh, this is uh, actually 
it, an effort that was done by the company and the FDA, looking actually the perception of the patient of improvement after treatment, which is kind of uh, a novel uh, way of doing trials. Uh, another thing that is very important, something that, that I'll talk in, 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 in the other lecture, is also the neurological events. Uh, they were able to show that they had less incidence of neurological events uh, with the use of arithema compared to placebo, which is something that that very rarely seen, but uh, it's one of the uh, side effects that we worry about when we're doing. Um, this is just showing you the uh, the amount of uh, side effects that they had from neurological compared to the uh, to the use of arithema. <coughs> now, some of the advantages of arithema is that it does works well. It's safe. Patients have immediate recovery. And um, the, the, there's, the company's going to great extent regarding the reimbursement using a J code. Now, some of the disadvantages is that it's a very expensive drug. It comes to about 71 cc, and when they use it in gray saphenous vein, an average about 10, 12 cc's uh, per treatment. Um, also, the reimbursement is still an issue. However, the company has set up themselves in a very good way to help physicians um, uh, trying to get reimbursed for it, although I doubt it will be reimbursed for cosmetic purposes. So in conclusion, there's not many drugs out in the pipeline on the industry for, for in the horizon for cosmetic sclerotherapy. Uh, most of the drugs that we use are actually off-label and many are not FDA approved. And actually, if you're gonna do cosmetic uh, sclerotherapy, I do recommend that you use a combination of techniques and have multiple tools available that you can use RF, microflobectomy. So thank you very much. Next presentation by Ms. Peggy Bush about selecting the proper sclerosin. Thank you. Hi, um, I'd like to thank Dr. Thorpe and Dr. Golzar for inviting me. My topic is selecting the proper sclerosin concentration and volume. There are many modalities to treating spider veins, not just the gold standard sclero. You can use laser, omic thermolysis, IPL, looks like I have omic twice there, Qtera, XLV, and minor surgical techniques. I don't have to go into this in too much detail because it was just went over. Um, but in our clinic, we mainly use um, Sertradecal. We do have polydocanol on hand. We do um, use the 3% and we do dilute it down. That will save you some money there. We use polydocanol mainly on patients that have the potential to stain um, Fitzpatrick 5 and 6. Um, as was stated, there are other hyperosmol or hypertonic solutions not FDA approved and um, he went over those in detail. As far as um, sotradecal polydocanol, you do have to um, brush up on your math. Um, you will have to dilute, dilute it down. Um, some of the percentages that we use are 0 0.2 for the small spider veins and 0 0.3. And by the way, I do um, have these PowerPoints available on our Venus blog, so um, they're already up and you can view them there. Here's a sertradecal table that I have, and it's, it's out there, and if you can't find it, be, you can find me, and I'd be happy to give it to you. It's the nurses like this. Everything's um, diluted for you in 10 mLs and 30 mLs. As far as um, reticular veins, we use foam sclerotherapy. Oftentimes, we use liquid, but mainly we start off with the foam. And um, we do have a video here, so if you could play that for me, you can see it being done. Can you turn the volume up too, please? Basically, we use two um, 3 ml syringes, a stopcock, and we use 0 0.5 of the sertradecal and 2 and a half cc's of CO2 or air if you don't have the medical grade CO2, and you just mix it back and forth, make the small bubbles, and you're ready to go.
We use CO2, if possible, since the bubbles do dissolve faster in the arterial circulation, thus reducing the risk of adverse events. We use the Tassari method as just shown. The advantages to using foam increases the surface area of the scleroset, thus reducing the amount of medication needed. Circumferential contact with the intimal wall causes more damage, see a better result. Displaces the blood, thus avoiding dilution of drug. Use in larger veins greater than 1.5 millimeters because foam is difficult to inject into the smaller ones. For the smaller veins, we use liquid. Disadvantages of using foam, patients with PFO may not be a candidate. Um, neurological de deficits such as migraines or scotoma. DVT, clear the deep system with the foot dorsiflexion immediately post-treatment and encourage ambulation. All of the above complications are extremely rare, especially DVT, since sotraducal deactivates rapidly, like in seconds. Using too high of a concentration may cause angiogenesis. So you use just lower, lower concentration and inject slower. Light sources. I would highly recommend a light source. There's quite a few out there. Um, we actually just purchased the AccuVein. It's transilluminal. You can see the reticular veins under the skin that you couldn't see with your naked eye. Um, it helps you locate the feeder veins that are causing the problem. You can see the foam sclerosant going into the, the complex. You can map your veins for phlebectomy, and it is an excellent marking tool. We have found that with the AccuVein, we pretty much use it on every patient. There's also this vein light. We used to use this, but it seems somewhat limited. It's kind of hard to hold and use the butterfly. It's got that C shape. It's, um, we, d we don't even use this one anymore. Treating reticular veins, um, as you can see by the blue arrows, um, you'll see the reticular vein that goes up to the complex, but you don't know, is this a reticular vein causing the problem, or could it possibly be a reticular vein coming from the top that you can't see? So with the AccuVein light, we're able to determine which vein is causing the problem and then treat that vein. This is the most typical pattern you will see in your clinic. And if you don't treat the reticular vein, um, you're going to have a very unhappy patient. You can treat those other veins, but they'll just come back. We use um, Sutradecal 0.3% foam, and lately it seems like we've been diluting that down to 0.18%. You can use a 1064 YAG laser if you have one. Um, in a patient like this now, instead of just doing your um, scleral therapy, um, laser, maybe omic thermolysis, we're actually doing something called the SCAT technique. It's surgical chemical ablative technique, and basically you're using um, scleral therapy with um, minor surgical techniques, whether they're um, a minor phlebectomy, or um, what we do is we use a number 11 blade, and every um, few millimeters we just do a little incision, and that kind of removes that trapped blood so the patient doesn't come back with a superficial thrombosis, and the patient gets much better cosmetic results. And, and you can charge more for this because you are using some t other techniques. In this particular vein, you would treat that reticular vein, and you, you don't need any vein light to see that, so 0.3% foam. Then we kind of milk the um, foam up into the other veins. And then you'll want to just use um, liquid on the smaller ones. Um, you might use a laser. You might use omic thermolysis for the little red veins. Um, for the little veins, we use Sutradecal 0.2 or 0.18 percent. Remember to inject slowly. Make sure you see blanching. Um, we have been using Arnica gel, and we have actually developed a cream called Dermica cream that you'll be hearing more about. Um, it's in the lab right now, and we're just starting to use it. It has um, properties such as Arnica and essential oils and vitamins. But um, it does help with bruising. I have found that I keep it in our clinic, and after we do phlebectomy, thermal ablation, anytime we do an incision, I put that on patients, and I recommend them to use Arnica um, twice a day for one week. And they come back, and they love it, and it, 
the bruising is down. We do have our patients wear compression stockings after um, scleral therapy. We live in Florida, and it is hot. They don't like it, but I can sometimes get them to get the thigh high, and if I'm lucky, they might wear them for a couple days. Um, it's kind of rare that you have in Florida for them to wear for a week. And as you know, the compression stockings, um, there's a lot of controversy with that. Um, they do provide comfort. Um, they kind of keep the, push the vein together, and they may minimize bruising. Here's a video of um, Dr. Bush actually treating the small spider veins with liquid scleral therapy. So you want to make sure you put that tip with the bevel up in the vein. And sometimes you'll see the blanching right there, and then you can go ahead and push slowly. And sometimes they kind of connect and you'll hit a lot of them, and sometimes you just got to retreat and you just keep doing this. And that's why a lot of doctors don't do it. You have your um, nurse practitioners, and in some states the RNs can do it. And where we're at in Florida, the RNs can't do scleral, but advanced practice nurses, nurse practitioners, they can do it. As far as volume, um, sclerosin, if you look at the insert, and I happen to look at the sotradecal insert, the max, maximum single dosage, dosage is 10 mLs. In the European consensus for foam, no more than 9 mLs. And in the Procomet study by Frulini et al., there were no neurological um, events, migraines, or visual disturbances using 5 mLs or less. Um, we try to use less foam, and um, we do use the foam for the reticulars, and then we move on to the liquid. In conclusion, make sure you have uh, appropriate training, and please go over the patient expectations. If you tell them ahead of time that you're going to look worse before you look better, that kind of thing, and what to expect, they're not, they're not going to be as mad. Educate the patient. Make sure they sign consent forms. Um, keep your concentration low and inject slowly. Any questions, feel free to email me. Thank you. So the next topic will be an expert panel discussion about complications in sclerotherapy, the matting, matting and pigmentation. So I'll just start showing you something that I, just to, to, to start with our discussion. This is how our patients, when they come to our office, want to see their legs look like. And this is how they get there. So these are the, the veins that we are supposed to treat and to not have any kind of complications because, especially in Brazil, visual results are very, very important. So what we do is, our patients get started with uh, wrapping with anesthetic cream to not get you know, any pain during the procedure. And then we sometimes we use the vein view to find the feeding veins and to treat that area of uh, 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 telangiectasia. And then we do have a lot of different sclerosin agents that we can use, that we, can, that we must choose for every skin type or patient, uh, different leg. And then we do the, the, the procedure, the, the sclerotherapy session, and then we wrap the leg with those elastic bandages so they can go home and you know, keep doing what they have to do during the day. So the discussion here is to talk about and learn about the matting and the pigmentation post sclerotherapy problems. Is this a skin type problem that we find in our, in our different patients? Is this a technical problem? Is there any other problem that I don't know that I, I really would like to learn with all of you participating here? So how do we avoid that complication? How do we treat it? So I, I would start asking, you know, the experts here on the table to start and tell us their experience. Dr. Bush, would you please start? And I really would like to call Dr. Golan to participate here because I really enjoy his ideas. Well, 
Thank uh, you. Dr. Bush? Okay. Um, yeah, matting and pigmentation are problems. And, you know, I really didn't understand the mechanism fully until I, uh, I had the advantage to uh, working uh, in close conjunction with the dermal pathology lab for years. Dr. Shaw and I, we published a lot of papers on histology. And we actually uh, were submitting this paper. I've had it done for a while. I haven't submitted it yet because I get lazy. But we actually did biopsies on different concentrations of spider veins after we injected with sclerotherapy, different concentrations of solution. Now, we just didn't go out there and grab the patient and do it. These patients also had phlebectomies done through one millimeter punch biopsies. And what we saw, they had deeper underlying varicosities and spider var varicosities over the veins. But what we saw was that as you increase the concentration of sclerotherapy solution, you actually dissolve the wall of the vein. Okay, so you, I can show you different uh, concentrations of sclerotherapy solution where the walls dissolve. When the walls dissolve, what do you get? You get extravasation of red cells, which cause pigmentation, and you get inflammatory changes. So the biggest cause of matting, but not the only one, the biggest cause of matting is using sclerotherapy solution that actually causes necrosis of the vein wall and then getting inflammatory responses. The other type of problem that you see when matting is that you close off a vein and then neovascularity occurs. So there are two different mechanisms, and we treat it usually with heat. We actually work together, husband and wife team, so um, we, don't, we don't see a lot of matting or um, pigmentation. We really don't. We use lower concentrations. Um, sometimes we get patients from other clinics that come in, and if the reticular vein's not addressed and they treat the spider veins, um, sometimes the patients will get angiogenesis, and they are not happy. Um, so with that, we would use some tumescin, and um, we mainly use omic thermolysis, better known as Vingo. Um, that works great on angiogenesis. Dr. Javier? What I noticed with my experience is that I, I saw a lot less matting as I got better on it. So I, I agree with, um, with Ron that actually uh, uh, trying to not to extravasate and and actually using lower concentration. And as your skills get better, you see a lot less of it. But sometimes you take all the measures necessary to use a low concentration, and you still get some patients that come back with it. And, um, uh, and uh, you just uh, don't know how you can prevent it. But using low concentration, as your skills get better and better, yeah, you see a lot less of it. Dr. Golan? As far as matting goes, that should be good. Um, again, I agree with everything they've said. I think the other thing is, is you want to try to inject with a low pressure and low volume. A lot of people, when you first start doing this, you inject with a lot of pressure because you want to see the entire lateral five blanch with a single injection. But there's some thought that when you inject under a lot of pressure, you open up little micro capillaries and create inflammation uh, just on that also. As far as hyperpigmentation goes, Again, when people first start doing this, and I, I see a lot of patients, again, for second opinions, um, they'll just get injected for sclerotherapy, and they're told, you know, go home, have a good life, and, you know, see me when they come back, when your spider veins come back. But if you inject someone uh, doing sclerotherapy, you just have to make them come back in three to four weeks, because they will all get thrombus trapped inside the vein you treat, and if you don't evacuate that, they will get fairly intense hyperpigmentation. So part of our consent actually says, you understand that you must come back for a follow-up visit of three to four weeks uh, to get optimal results. Uh, so we try to put a little bit of the onus on the patient. Uh, you just can't inject them and expect to get a good result. Can I add one thing that before we go on, that when we do sclerotherapy, uh, a lot of times if the veins of sufficient volume, we will do immediate, about five minutes after we do the sclerotherapy, we'll inject tumescent underneath the vein, and then about every inch we divide the vein with 11 blade. And that way they don't get retained clot for the most part, and you have good resolution immediately. And one other point, if your patient is on iron, take them off. I want to add that uh, to that is that when you start with a patient, don't, don't try to do too much on the first visit. 
So, <laughs> so you can see how they respond to it. And uh, if they have a lot of matting or pigmentation, then you can adjust your treatment. But what I suggest you do is on the first treatment, just do um, uh, be kind with it and, and not do too much that day just so they can get a and <clears throat> see what, how they respond. A lot of people respond differently, and that's a, that's a good uh, 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 thing to do, that, that just see how they respond on the initial therapy. Dr. George. Um, so again, I think this was touched upon earlier. If you're gonna do visual sclerotherapy, uh, then you should have the patience for doing it. So I think, uh, you know, it takes time, it takes effort. You need to dedicate that time to taking care of that patient. And um, if you don't have the time to do it, if you wanna rush from one case to another, this is probably not the right thing for you. Um, the other thing is, so that's for the reticular veins, and then if you're doing the larger veins, um, you know, sometimes you need a combination therapy. We've talked about uh, using multiple tools, and uh, sometimes sclerotherapy alone is not going to work, and you may need to do adjunctive phlebectomy, uh, and that's how I proceed with my patients. We tend to do a lot of uh, phlebectomy with the sclerotherapy uh, for treatment of the patient, so. Dr. Chopra? I take a slightly different approach to this. Where when the patient first comes to me, I actually say, what's the area you want treated? So let's say it's the lateral tie like you showed. Now, we know that venous hypertension is the cause of all of this problem. So I always try to find out, is there something else feeding it underneath? If I find a reticular network or a perf coming in, I'll actually inject foam in it at the deeper level and massage it up all the way into all these branches and I explain to the patient, you're gonna need three to five sessions. And then we work our way through it from the deeper branch to the next bigger reticular branch to the fine telangiectasias, and I use the vein wave for the very fine stuff. And then show, I show them pictures over the next few, how, how they're gonna progress, and the results have been spectacular. What I don't do is just start randomly injecting and then that's where the matting occurs, blood's trapped, so they have to come back for the second. I make all those appointments the first time. I make them commit to it, otherwise I won't do it. And that, and, and, and the point there is you find the source of the hypertension, which has to be a small valve, I'm not gonna do laser, but if they have deeper reflux, central truncal reflux, that's gotta be treated first and work my way back. But, okay, my question to, to you guys is, we have this patient that we did sclerotherapy, and two weeks later, they will come back, and they already have that pigmentation in the spot of our puncture. So what do you do? I mean, do you send them to a dermatologist? Do you, do, do you <laughs> give them clearing creams to use, or do you say, just tell them to wait and see what happens. What do you, you, we say, do? You, you say where you did the puncture, they developed yeah, small veins? And they already IPL. The, the brown. IPL. Works great, no matter what, brown, red. Don't, you know, a dermatologist is fine, but we, we work with dermatologists, and most yeah. of them don't know anything about veins. So, but, but they do have IPL. So those people do respond very well to IPL, if you have IPL. Does the hyperpigmentation go away, or do you actually use it to treat the spider veins instead of sclerotherapy? And as a second question, you know, the, the thing that you'd expect is if you're treating patients with type 5 or 6 skin, that is Afro-American, Middle Eastern, Indian, you would think that they would get the best results. But in fact, those are the patients that come back with the worst hyperpigmentation. So how do you all deal with those patients? Well, the IPL does get both pigmentation and does get vessels at that wavelength. You know, IPL usually is around a wavelength. They use 560 to 590, which is, is rapidly absorbed by blood. It also breaks up pigment. And as far as the doing the Afro-Americans, uh, we use very dilute sotradeco. We start at 0.1%. And like somebody mentioned, we do a test, like Julio mentioned. We see how they're going to respond. And also that if they do pretty well, we go ahead and we do this scat technique where we actually divide the vessel after we inject it. It's really amazing how fast it clears up. And I just might want to make one other uh, comment. When I was in uh, Italy at the, uh, the Sclerotherapy 2014, the Italians are tremendous pathophysiologists of venous disease. For spider veins, they actually, they actually will go in and they'll see which vein is the draining reticular and which one is the feeding reticular. Where we in America, we just do everything. 
but they'll actually leave the draining reticular veins open. They think that decreases matting, maybe. And one bit of advice that's so important, when your patient comes in for a consult, do a test dose. Um, we might test them with 0 0.18, we might test them with OMIC or laser. That way you get an idea of um, how they're going to react. They kind of understand what they're gonna look like, do it in a, an area that, you know, in case they do get this hypopigmentation, you can adjust your medicine. But I would highly recommend doing a test dose, have them fill out consent forms. They do have unrealistic expectations. And you have to let them know that they're not going to have Barbie doll legs, but you're, they're going to see um, resolution and improvement, but they're not going to be perfect. Any questions? It was, if you, the pigmentation comes from the blood trapped in there. Does everybody agree on that? No, so, it's wrong. It right? comes from two different methods. It comes yes, from it trapping not. and it comes from extraversation of red cells. There's two different pigmentations. Okay. Two different. So if you don't allow the extravasation, which you said is really a matter of not forcing too much and very high concentrations. Well, that's one, but that's the reason that we do these bi we do these punctures of the vein after we treat these larger spider varicosity of one millimeter. That's why we divide the vein with an 11 blade because we've done two things. We've expressed the potential clot, okay, and we also get out any you know that uh, we get out any blood that's there already, and it may decrease the efficiency. It may it may decrease the tendency for uh, destruction of the cell wall, because the longer that this is in contact, the, the sclerotherapy solution, even though it's deactivated, if you have a lot of sclerotherapy solution and you don't have the blood to deactivate it, it's going to keep going through the vein wall. That's why the, that's, we prove that with different concentrations. So we just get, we wait about three to five minutes, get everything out, press all the blood out, wrap them up, and usually our goal is to get 80% gone with one treatment. So the answer really seems prevention is better than the cure. That Absolutely. Just avoid the hyperpigmentation. But once you get it, then it's more of a dermatological problem. Is that right? Yeah, you just use heat. You can use any kind of laser heat. YAG, 940. Um, I've seen the, the Italians take a bare tip fiber and hit it. You know, I, it's just amazing to get these big spots. But the good thing about the skin, everything heals very rapidly, and the reason it does, the squamous epithelium regenerates, is because you're treating a very small area, and the eccrocan glands are regenerate squamous cells very quickly. You can actually see them coming out of the eccrocan glands after injury. It's pretty cool. So you do the, uh, the, the, the stab right after? If it's a millimeter or more, we stab it no matter what, right after. Just Reticular or blade, just? 11 blade, about every maybe inch or two, yeah. You mean the feeding vein? Huh? The, midi, the feeding vein for that area? Anything. Anything we inject, we stab. I don't care. If, if Usually it's, it's the spider veins or the reticular veins. If they're very large, I'll just do a little phlebectomy. But if they're like two millimeters. But you do the phlebectomy before you do the sclerotherapy? No. So it doesn't make any difference. You can do any time. Because in Brazil, we, there is this idea that you have to get rid of the feeding vein before you do the sclerotherapy, and sometimes you do the phlebectomy, and once you get back, there are fewer veins to be sclerosed after that, two weeks after that? Yeah, I don't know, because you know, most people are not going to tolerate coming in, getting a little phlebectomy, then you come back, they want everything done at once, oh. that's why we do it. That's why we, that's why, that's why we do it that way, but I, I don't know. Do you do, uh, like, uh, cephanectomy with phlebectomy and sclerotherapy at the same time? Uh, you mean do you I do? You don't understand that? Me a third, you do I do a patient to the OR? And no, I don't go to the OR. We do everything oh, in the, okay. we do everything in the outpatient but clinic. Is, right. is this common done here? I mean the great saphenous vein ablation with phlebectomy and a sclerotherapy at the same oh, time? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. The exit phlebectomy, if we're doing an endovenous ablation, I always take out the first varicity that comes off the saphenous vein. That's called the exit phlebectomy. Always do that. Then I see them back, they need more, you can do it, or, you know, let's see. In Brazil, we, we didn't do that. I mean, the, you do the surgery first, and then after recovery, you do the sclerotherapy, and, the, you know, it's kind of starting game and the end of the game. 
No, of scleroth of cosmetic veins, we don't do it at the same time, but they're cosmetic. We do the, you know, yeah. right. If it's cosmetic, we haven't come back because that's not in the, that's, you're not going to get reimbursed for, cos, but, for doing that unless yeah. you do cosmetic. But our patients keep asking us to do everything mm -hmm. at the same time because they need to get ready for summer. <laughs> that's why. <laughs> Chico, I, so, have a, I have a question for Dr. Bush. I, I feel like I'm missing something, so if, if I'm confused, maybe someone else is too. But when you do the small stab phlebectomy with 11 blade, just a little tiny, it, aren't you causing it all to squeeze out of the vein? And do you get uh, an associated bruising in some patients because of that? No, it's leaking out onto the skin. Not oh, outside, it's coming It's the out, out, okay. outside, I right. I thought it was kind of like... It, no, no, it's coming outside. You're getting it out, you're, you're getting okay. out like you would do a, get, get, like a clot. You express oh, okay. it out. I see, that I was, thank you. We'll show you that in the next, one of the next presentations. So I do it the Brazilian way, actually. That's how I, I don't do it, I do it the way you do it with my patients. I bring them back for, I give them multiple session appointments and phase it out. And then it, they may be tight appointments, but I don't do it that way. It's interesting. Maybe you've got to try it and, mm -hmm. and do a lot. And yeah, we do thermal ablation. We do exit phlebectomy. Sometimes if the insurance pays for it, we do all the phlebectomy. And we will treat a small area with scleral just to see how they react. Plus, we like our patients to be happy. They are so happy they come back. Plus, we live in West Palm. We work in West Palm Beach, and they only expect, I mean, they don't want to look bad at all there. One of, one of the problems is uh, when, when you do the ablation is that the patient stays with the bulges there and then they don't think you did anything. So a lot of time, even though you get, you don't get, many times you don't get reimbursed as you should for a phlebectomy, you don't want the patient, an unhappy patient. So I, I tend to do all my thermals and immediately I do phlebectomy. And like Ron says, there's actually uh, less chance of, uh, of reopening uh, of the vessel when you do it. You know, I've, instead of the exit phlebectomy, I've been doing the uh, the foam. I take sotradecol, make it one and four, higher concentration, and that whole branch going down, I just let it kind of sclerose down. And I've been doing less and less of phlebectomy because they tend to hate that little uh, tugging, number one, and number two, whatever little dots they have left. Has anybody else tried that? Yeah, we, yeah, we can do, do, one of the people I work with does foam sclerotherapy, but they have a lot of, you know, clot retraction and, you know, hyperpigmentation, especially in the Hispanic population. That is not a good thing to do. But if you do tumescent, just like, you know, use the same solution, tumescent for doing a phlebectomy, they don't feel anything. Two-inch margin, it's perfectly, perfectly painless. So if you're all thoroughly confused at this point, uh, <laughs> You know, one thing to remember is that sclerotherapy is part science and part art, and it gets back to the photography, is you have to take photographs of your patients, and you can learn very quickly. You, you do something, you try what Ron's talked about, you try what I do or what Romy does, and you see how the patient looks in four weeks, and then you alter your behavior. And if you have photographs so you know what things look like before, what they look like four weeks later and three months later, you can ramp up pretty quickly and get very facile and get excellent results. But it's going to be a matter of trial and error in the beginning. And obviously, as you can tell, listening to us, there's lots of different ways of skinning this cat. Um, and in the end, you have to figure out what works best for you and your patients. If I could add a comment, for two years, when I first started vein practice in general, and I wasn't, didn't even know a thing about sclerotherapy, I started doing it. For two years, I did them for free for the patients till I got really good at one technique and started getting good results. Any other question from the audience? So, and uh, to, to go over more what uh, uh, Dr. Roach says is that uh, when you do, if you want to get good at, uh, at sclerotherapy and, and spiders in particular, when you do your ablation, just spend a few minutes uh, there doing the, the spider and reticular veins there so you can get your skills a lot better and, and, and build it. So that's another way to, to get your skills ramp up is doing it after you do your ablation and, and just uh, treat a few of the reticulars and spiders. Okay, thank you. We just have to move on. I'll ask Dr. John George to talk about ultrasound guidance sclerotherapy. Thank you. All right. Um, ultrasound guidance sclerotherapy. I think we've pretty much covered everything about sclerotherapy. 
Um, so I'm going to go through, these, uh, through this quick. Uh, I have no disclosures pertaining to this particular talk. Um, we talked about what sclerotherapy is. Uh, it's the injection of a foreign substance into a vein to induce an inflammatory response. So you're really trying to cause that uh, endothelial damage uh, without destroying the entire structure. Uh, and then eventual thrombosis and uh, fibrosis and then resorption of the vein over time. Uh, the indications, uh, we kind of talked over a lot of this, uh, telangiectasia, small varicosities uh, in the absence of venous reflux, residual veins of varicosities that are large that recur post-surgery for, uh, for varicose veins. And you see a lot of this even uh, in your, uh, as a cardiologist, I see this even uh, post-bypass uh, surgery after uh, veins have been harvested for bypass. Uh, small congenital malformations. Um, and then what are the contraindications? Uh, pregnancy, uh, febrile with evidence of acute illness, uh, severe peripheral arterial disease, although this is, this is all variable. This is all relative uh, contraindications. Uh, acute superficial thrombophlebitis in the segment that you are going to treat is, is really a contraindication. Uh, advanced rheumatic disease, osteoarthritis, diseases impacting the ability uh, for the patient to be mobile, uh, you know, again, what are you going to gain from doing this, uh, doing this therapy uh, for this patient? Uh, elderly and sedentary, we talked about the skin condition and what their skin color is to begin with, uh, overall health and mobility, history of severe allergies, uh, and, uh, you know, doing a test shot, like we heard earlier, uh, is, is a good uh, trial in these patients, especially if they have a lot of allergies. We have no idea if they'll react differently to the sclerosant. Um, and consider the different types of uh, sclerosing agents. And uh, we've spent a lot of time going over that. I won't uh, go over all of that again, uh, but really you have the detergent uh, solutions, you have the osmotic solutions and the chemical ones. Uh, and despite what kind of agent you use, again, the end result is the same. You're trying to cause endothelial inflammation uh, and uh, eventual occlusion. We talked about foam sclerotherapy uh, until recently. We talked about uh, varathena that is now uh, approved, uh, which is a, a microfoam with polyducanol. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's commonly used in Europe, it's commonly used here, even before we had uh, uh, FDA approval. Uh, and then this is where ultrasound comes in. It, it's helpful uh, to control exactly where you're injecting and for uh, safety of the, of the injection. So the idea is that you visualize exactly where you inject the foam. Uh, we talked about the Tessari method uh, to to create this foam um, uh, with a stopcock and two syringes, uh, and, uh, uh, and then you use the ultrasound and, and inject it. So what can we use this for specifically, ultrasound-guided sclerotherapy, sclerotherapy uh, for incompetent perforating veins, uh, for perforator veins with anatomically challenging morphology. Sometimes they're very tortuous uh, in anatomy and difficult to get a needle into for a stylet or for a laser. Um, and uh, then this becomes very helpful um, uh, to use. We talked about the complications, uh, again, so cutaneous necrosis, uh, depending on the volume, depending on the concentration, so uh, lower concentration, as we said earlier, smaller uh, volumes, uh, just enough necessary to, uh, uh, to blanch out the vein. Um, Systemic uh, allergic uh, reaction or toxicity can be a um, complication. Arterial injection, obviously you never want to do that, especially when you're doing these perforators. You want to make sure that you, you don't inject enough that you go into the deep veins. Um, uh, nerve uh, damage or paresthesias, air embolism, uh, visual disturbances, migraines. So there's some talk about uh, you know, PFOs and whether you need to screen for PFOs in, in patients where you do uh, large volumes of foam sclerotherapy. And, uh, you know, none of this is necessary if you're careful in, in the amount that you inject. Uh, DVTs, PEs, paradoxical embolization, stroke, superficial thrombophlebitis, all of these have been described as, as complications. Uh, and again, the key is to be careful. Uh, local reactions, uh, we kind of had just spent uh, 10 minutes talking about this as an expert panel about uh, how to avoid the local reactions with matting and ecchymosis and bruising and hyperpigmentation, hypopigmentation, 
Uh, obviously, skin necrosis is the worst uh, situation. You don't want to get to that point. Um, allergic reactions are, are, can be common. You can have inflamed areas. Yeah, you want to try to uh, avoid that. And uh, again, it's a, it's a little bit redundant. We've already talked about a lot of this stuff, and, uh, and, and I will end there. Thank you. So next presentation, I will invite Dr. Her Romy Chopra to present his pre-recorded live case about step-by-step -step phlebectomy. Please. They cut my whole, they cut it short, jeez. I had my whole Rocky routine going here. That was quick. Jeez. <laughs> You had a longer yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> good movie, good movie. Oh, he's playing it again. There you go. Okay. I wanted some Mission Impossible type music, but they cut it out. Actually, I play music for all the patients. I ask them what music they want. I had Pandora. And if they say whatever you want, then I play Indian Bollywood music, and it's a party. And some patients will tell me, what's the matter? You're not singing today? And I'll say, well, I'm thinking of the ex-wife, so I'm not feeling good today, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Only a few people laughed, but that's OK. <laughs> Are you going to play that, or is it? All right. But I, you know, one thing I do for sclerotherapy and stuff, and all this, even some of the complicated stuff we do, is I try to make it as much fun for the patients and make it very down to earth, completely chill out. So I tell them all kinds of jokes we have all the time. I call it vocal anesthesia. Yeah. A drop of any sedation in your office. It works. I think we played this yesterday too, so some of you Hello may have again. seen it. So I'm going to demonstrate to you um, the procedure of phlebectomy. Uh, we have a young lady here, she's uh, 32 years old, uh, has had venous reflux, she's had other treatments done before. She has a large branch on the lateral surface of her leg that uh, has been bothering her. She had it injected before, but these always don't uh, work. And what she probably needs right now, obviously, is a phlebectomy, which I'm going to demonstrate to you. So I'm going to focus on her leg here and show you. What I have in my hand is a, uh, the AccuVein light. You can see how well that branch is seen laterally going all the way down uh, in her foot. I'm going to actually mark this now with a marker so that when I'm doing the phlebectomy, it will be much easier for me to identify the branches. So there are two ways. Some folks will mark it on the vein itself. Others will put it along the side. I like to get an idea of uh, along the pathway how I have it, as you can see with that. I always hand the patient a mirror so they can see what I am going to do. Can you see that with yes. the mirror? And so they have an idea. And I always also look for where the reflux uh, originates from. We've already treated that. Uh, and now today she's in here for a feedback. So I am now prepping the leg, and uh, I'm just using chloroprep. You'll notice that these markers tend to wash away. That's where this light uh, is actually excellent in that I can still see what I'm doing. Uh, it doesn't need a lot of uh, fancy prepping. I usually limit it to something like this. As you can see here now, I can see the vein. I've already marked it. I know this is the segment that I want to phlebectomize. There are two ways you can do this. One is uh, I give some lidocaine around this. Some folks like to puncture on top of it, or some like to go in slightly from the side. Personally, I like to go a little from the side. I feel a tiny little pinch here. All right. So as you can see here, I've got tumescent in a uh, 
30 cc syringe. I got an 18 gauge needle. I've already given some lidocaine here so she shouldn't feel this. I like to give a little tumescent along this, this track. Uh, sh with the lidocaine, she shouldn't feel this at this point. I make sure I'm not inside the vein and as I, I'm giving some of that tumescent uh, underneath. She won't, don't want to overdo it because sometimes you lose sight of the vein as you're doing this as well. Often it'll track along the track along the vein as you can and see here. Uh, in obese patients, it can be a slightly uh, bigger problem. I try to take the same track path and then just inject along that pathway. As you can see here, now the beauty with this light is I can still continue to see the vein underneath. Uh, if I switch off this light, you will see how difficult that becomes. Now you can see without the AccuVein light, all I can rely on is these dots. And with those dots, now I don't exactly know where the vein is underneath. So now for phlebectomy, I prefer to use those, uh, the AccuVein, and I can see what's happening underneath it. So I'm gonna turn the light back on and try and go from there. So I've given, I try to make as few puncture spots as I've just done one. I'll go back the other way as well. And I, I aspirate just to make sure I'm not uh, inside the blood vessel there and then also give a little further higher up. So one way to do this is you can just use the bare uh, scalpel or uh, which is a number 11 or put a little uh, hemostat on it to prevent it from going too deep. I, I'd never find the need to really do that. There are other devices available so I'll go right next to it and give a tiny little pinch. You should not feel any of this. Down the leg I've learned you want to make this as vertical as possible. As you can see now I've got the Mueller hooks here. There are four different types. Uh, I'm not too picky. Um, I tend to do way less phlebectomies than I used to and you try to match the one uh, that will fit the size of the vein. So I'm going to try and use this one right here. And uh, I've got that tiny little skin nick. I'm going to go in there, get underneath that branch, hook it up, you feel it, twist it around, and you see the pearly white vein coming up. If you give adequate tumescence, you rarely ever uh, hear complaints from the patient. As you can see here, I've got the, the pearly white one, and you tend to land up tugging on it like that. Oftentimes, they break like that, which is okay. And then I'll grab one end on one side and pull it. And oftentimes, I may not even pull the whole thing out and actually just let it break underneath and just uh, go back and forth. Got a little oozing from there. So here now, that was the first sight. Uh, sometimes you won't get it. You'll feel a little tag of the skin. You can see that, but I've broken the vein. That's good enough. I'm going to try and catch it up here higher up. And you can see now I got that. And you see the whole segment popped up at this end, so right there. <coughs> and um, I can grab that. And as you can see here, pull it out. Sometimes they're just they're fragile because these are damaged veins. And they pop right out uh, in your hand. Did that vein have previous sclerotherapy? Yes, she had. Some. Yeah, that's probably. As you can see right there. You'll see a little oozing from here. That's the two spot. I'll do one more up here. The third spot, just again a little higher up, same, grab the vein underneath, pearly white. Oftentimes you'll catch, you could potentially catch a nerve fiber next to it, but if you're careful enough, you won't, and if there's not a lot of inflammation, uh, you'll see. But you know you're in the vein if you get heme like blood like that, and uh, looks good so far. And uh, some people get excited about how much they can remove, but if you want to pull this out now, uh, you take this, not more than a, a centimeter or a few millimeters at a time, literally you catch it underneath, you pull on it till it actually literally tugs and breaks at the other end. And th I've reached that point and I can see her jumping a little bit because uh, it probably pulled up at a spot where this was not uh, anesthetized. And then a little compression. Often you'll have a little skin tag right at the spot. But you can see otherwise it's good. If you get the skin tag, I'll usually 
just uh, not a skin, but just a tag from the some fibers. I put it in because you don't want the tag staying out to heal. I then will clean this up with uh, with some hydrogen peroxide. Um, it tends to work pretty well, and then after that, put in steri strips on it. So as you can see here, um, the after a while the oozing stops. Uh, if we turn on the AccuVane light, you'll see that's fragment. There'll be some heme underneath that. Maybe look like a little bruise along that track, as you can see along that pathway. But we know we've broken up that fragment of vein. The one underneath will not fill much anymore, and we've already taken care of the perforator uh, higher up. All right. I'm going to clean this up with a little peroxide, just some thrown on a gauze. It uh, helps clean the wound up, but also it's not really a wound. Uh, and at the same token, it uh, also acts uh, in helps in rather stopping the blood uh, from oozing out too much. So uh, I'm going to now put some steri strip on it. And what I'll do is tend to go up and across it. As you can see, it's pretty clean. I'll do one the other way. There's no real. Uh, formula to this, but just enough to keep the tension uh, on it and let it heal. I ask the patients not to take this off for uh, 24, 48 hours. So I literally just let it uh, kind of fall off on their own. First 24 hours, I'll often tell them to put something like a saran wrap or something on this and just let the, uh, uh, when they can have a shower. I don't limit activity. I think activity is good for them. As you can see, it looks very good will give her a nice compression wrap at this point. One of the secrets to compression is you don't want to compress the entire leg. What you want is the compression needs to be on the uh, vessel or the vein that you just treated. So I tend to roll up a gauze like this and put it along the pathway of the vein. And then I will give them uh, a wrap. So the rest of the muscles have just normal compression, but this is the one that is really getting proper compression. All right, thank you, and that's lobectomy. It's uh, fairly simple to do. Uh, this was a, a much easier case. Oftentimes, you can have large branches and going across the thigh or uh, almost down the entire leg. So as you can see here, that rolled piece of gauze is right underneath. That was along the path of the vein. Then we have a, some gauze right here. This allows, if there's any oozing uh, from the tumescent or blood to be absorbed, and then a compression on top. And it's not very tight. Uh, it's enough to give her a gentle compression, but the inner gauze allows the compression to be on the vein itself. So this was a simple phlebectomy procedure. Sometimes they're much larger. Could be in a larger patient or larger branch in the thigh. Uh, it's important to know that the source of feeding has been taken care of. Otherwise, when they stand up, they can bleed a lot. Uh, but as you can see, it's a very simple and easy procedure. Great, thank you. Questions, comments, ideas? Anybody on the panel? Somebody must be. I, might, I just want to uh, add a thing that w when I pull the vein up, uh, I clamp it, or Pe Peggy does a lot of phlebectomies when she pulls it up. Uh, we actually take an 18 gauge needle and we can feel where the branch is going. And we just take a needle three or four inches downstream or upstream, just divide it with an 18 gauge needle, and then the whole thing comes out. So it's a nice trick. Take a needle. Divide the vein. That way, you don't have to make as many incisions. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. If you if you grab a nerve and you pull it, you're breaking it. Then they'll get paresthesias in that region. You can usually tell if there's a nerve right. Five, one is they'll they'll yell at you right away. But if you've got enough tumescent, then they may not feel it, but you'll see it. So uh, unless, uh, the only thing you want to grab is the poorly white right vein, vein that shows up and check it. Now, this was a smaller one, and she'd had uh, sclerotherapy before, so it's some inflammation, so they didn't come out smoothly. If they're large enough, they just come out like linguini or something like that, and you'll see them, what they call the inverted U, and then you can pull up one way and the other. I mean, I've pulled out several centimeters, I mean, 10, 15 sometimes. It really 
doesn't matter how much you pull out, you interrupt them, it'll be fine. But avoid the nerves, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chopra. Now, Dr. Ron Bush, talking about hand sclerotherapy. Thank you. As an added point, if you're you know, doing a phlebectomy, all of a sudden you say, hmm, what's this piece of dental floss doing in the wound? Then you know you got a nerve. So nerves look like dental floss, so don't pull out dental floss. I'm going to talk about hand veins and facial veins because if I talked about hand veins, hand veins alone, I'd be done in three minutes, so I'm going to take up some extra time. So we're going to talk a little bit about hand veins and facial veins because we're in a cosmetic setting. Most of our work is done in a dermatology clinic. He, uh, our dermatologist owns 23 clinics. They're each being outfitted with their own radiotherapy units. It's quite an operation, but they don't do veins. So. Uh, the, the dermapathologist that I did most of my research with on histology, they were classmates. So when I moved to Florida, he called me up and said, come work with me, and you can be our vein guy doing cosmetics. So you have to know your anatomy if you're going to do facial veins. It's very important. You don't want to inject towards the nose or towards the eye or towards the brain. Very simple. Why don't you keep that needle out that way? You're going to be okay. This just shows that the, uh, what you want to do is, is aim towards the pterygoid plexus, which is right in here. That's where all the veins of the face really drain, except the frontal vein and the suborbital vein can drain into the, uh, the, 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 the suborbital vein can drain into the uh, uh, ophthalmic vein, and the uh, frontal vein can drain into the sagittal vein. So. If you, but if you know your anatomy, you're going to stay out of trouble. You've got to remember also the foam's rap, rapidly deactivated. So, I mean, I carefully searched, and I couldn't find anybody getting, you know, uh, eye, uh, eye blindness from sclerotherapy. The only, th the only complication you see sometimes is necrosis and if, if you inject into an artery. So uh, sclerotherapy on the face, if you do it right, is very, very safe. And we're going to show you some studies here. Uh, this patient you can see right here, we see this kind of patient. She has these marked red veins here, uh, these little red. This is, this is not uh, rosacea. This is just red veins. Rosacea is usually associated with an inflammatory complex. Now, I have an omic, omic thermoliasis, which is vein go, radio frequency, a small needle. It works excellent, the best treatment for this, or a 940 laser. Or a 532, but a 532 and 940 are very expensive. Omics a lot cheaper. So it takes care of these veins, these red veins. And we see a lot of patients in Florida. I actually probably treat two to three patients a day for face veins. It's very common because of sun exposure. So you see a lot of that. So if you're in an area that you have a lot of them, you might, you might consider adding that to your, to your um, practice. This is a patient that has uh, these very, you don't see it as well here, but these are these. Uh, temporal veins, okay? They can be treated with sclerotherapy. In this case, you would aim here with the needle, the foam, while your assistant keeps pressure there, okay? So the foam would be directed into the pterygoid plexus. Just don't go into the artery, okay? It's not a good thing. You'll have massive skin necrosis. In this case, we would use about 0.2% sutradecal. Very safe. Now, We'll show you another case. Uh, this is the one, this patient could be treated with omic thermolysis or a 940 laser. The Dornier is a laser that, that, would, that we use at times when we have it. Uh, in our clinic and in, in, in the dermatology, they don't have the 940, so we use omic. But you can see this is the, the telegentasia on the nose, very common. Again, two to three patients a day we treat either with facial veins or nose veins or chin veins, uh, these red veins, and they get excellent result. This usually clears up in one treatment. And they come back about two or three years, and you can do a few more because they don't stay out of the sun. This is a patient before we, I had a 94, a 1064 laser. You can see this is a young boy with a large, large vein. It's a, a sagittal vein here, comes up, connects here, goes under the eye a little bit, then down the face, then over towards this way to the pterygoid plexus. You don't see it as well there. Now, I did not have a laser, a 1064 laser to use on him. I didn't want to inject foam sclerotherapy up here, so I made a small neck here and did a phlebectomy. 
and then did injected foam down here this way. Complete clearance in one treatment. Happy kid, go out to the baseball field again, not have people look at him and ask him how he got a bruise. He real, real neat kid. This laid there when I did that little phlebectomy because he wanted it done. He didn't want to do it anymore. This patient I treated with a 1064 Cutera. Right here, you can see the vein coming down. It's quite marked, large. This is after one treatment. This is one treatment, one month gone. So a 1064 YAG that's properly cooled, that you have to give about 160 to 180 joules, is great for any blue-green any blue -green vein of the face is usually gone in one treatment. If you got a 1064, it costs about eighty to $100,000, though. So you've got to have about, I figure, at least 100,000 patients to, to use it to make a profit. This, again, that same patient, you can see it, it's gone, has not come back. It's an excellent, excellent, excellent laser, but very expensive. Suborbital vein, you can do a 1064 YAG, you can do a foam sclerotherapy, or you can do a phlebectomy. I've done them all, okay? Anyone works well, however you're comfortable. This is the Nordian 940. You can see this blue vein here that we're treating. Works excellent. This is gone in one treatment. This is another patient you can see that has like little red veins. You can treat this with a different combining IPL. You can use, you can use the uh, Dornier 940 or Omic. This is probably the hardest vein to treat on the, on the face because these are these super, uh, uh, these veins on the eyelid. They're, they're, they're not really super orbital. They're actually just varices, little tiny uh, spider varices on the eyelid. Not common, okay? Now, this next slide is going to make you quench. You're going you're gonna to like think, how did he do that? Watch. There we go. Injecting it. Isn't that something? Injecting it with 0.1 sotraducal solution. You know what? Cleared up. One treatment. So it works. And they got, that guy wanted it gone. I, you know, I, I can't believe he sat there and watched me do it. <laughs> or he let me do it. But he did. This just shows you, this is another vein here coming down the side of the cheek. You would use a 1064 if you had it. If not, direct the foam in fairly and inject it. This just shows you why we're doing it here. Your assistant can hold pressure here. This, oh, I'll go back. Let me go back here. We only inject about a half cc of foam is enough to take care of that vein. You can see a little, little, ah, uh, darn it. I'm sorry, I keep running. You can see a little hematoma here. That's the problem with injecting some of these veins. You see that, you just stop. You know, wait another three weeks and redo it if you need to. I showed you that one just to show you that sometimes these veins are very friable and they can, they can uh, blow up. This is omic thermolysis. You can see it, use it with magnification. It's uh, just a small needle that, uh, it's a 35 gauge needle that actually penetrates the vein, you give pulses, and it actually uh, obliterates the vein. Because most veins on the face are, are within 300 microns of the skin. Most spider veins are within three to 700 microns. So you have to have something that can penetrate the skin. And this is very easy to do with the omic. Okay, the deeper veins, it's not gonna work. Okay, because you can't get the needle that far. If it does, it hurts too much. You have to have either a laser or you have to use sclerotherapy for the deeper veins. This just shows you us doing it right here, another one. This shows you what it looks like after we do. You can see it's kind of red. That's normal. That's a normal response. It'll be that way for about three or four days, and it'll get like little dots, but everything goes back to normal within about two weeks. It's hard to kill the skin. That's the biggest thing I learned in my 20 years of doing veins. You really have to work to do something bad. So points to remember. So, Suborbital veins are very common. If you got a laser, 1064, it's great. If you don't, you can try foam. If that makes you skittish, send them someplace else, okay? Always direct the needle laterally. Temporal veins can be treated with foam or phlebectomy if they're very large. We prefer not to do little incisions on the face. Anything in the forehead, uh, I will do a phlebectomy. And the midline veins, because they're usually quite large and I don't like to inject things up into the sagittal sinus. Points to remember, if you have a 1064, you use 160 joules. So we're going to real quick look at 
hand veins. You can actually go through this. Hand veins. A lot of women in Florida don't like their hand veins. They go out to dinner and they got these big rings on and they you know, can't really see the rings, they got too many veins. So uh, to them it's a problem. Uh, sometimes they come in, I can't see what they're talking about, but for them it is. So we do different things. We do foam sclerotherapy, phlebectomy, or a combination of both, okay? So in my practice, I do a phlebectomy of the larger veins, and some are quite large, and then, you, and then I use foam sclerotherapy for veins under three millimeters, and then we'll show you the technique here in a minute. This is a patient I did with phlebectomy and sclero. Nice result, okay? And she, she had, I mean, I could see hers when she came in that she did have a problem. Uh, so we did um, phlebectomy of these veins, little tiny neck here, 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 and then did sclerotherapy, the smaller ones. Okay? So great result, that's one month. This just shows you where we did it. This is another patient you can see. I did this is just I just did one vein to show you here. I'll finish them up later. You can see this vein right here, fairly prominent. Okay. So what we do, you can see the veins cannulated. Foam is injected. Now, these veins didn't really communicate, so the foam mainly stayed here and went back up a little bit. Put pressure on for about three to four minutes. Inject tamesin under the treated vein. Take an 11 blade at about every five millimeters or so, make an incision with the 11 blades so you actually go through the vein, divide the vein. So you now you got mechanical disruption. You can get rid of anything that's trapped in there. There's what four. There's about two days after right here. A, you can see already the marked resolution and just a little tiny tiny thrombus right there. It's an excellent technique, okay? It's easy to learn, easy to do. Some, some of our members uh, are, are actually just do scleral therapy, bring them back in a month and poke out the clot. So a lot of different ways to treat it. And it, it's, 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 it's a very nice technique to know because a lot, of, a lot of, w of women want this done. A few men, <laughs> but yeah, that's, I don't know why they do. Anyway, so adding the treatment of the hand and facial veins, augment your practice, okay? Get proper training before you undertake any of these techniques, which is just go with somebody for, you know, a day or so, watch how you do it, or have them come to you and do some with them. Knowing your anatomy is to the trouble, there's nothing on the back of the hand that you can hurt unless you're in the uh, hypothenar eminence where the branch of the radial nerve comes up. That's it, there's nothing back there, okay? Yeah, you can't do anything. You take out a vein, it's very simple, it's very safe. Okay, thanks. Okay, next presentation, Dr. Javier presenting challenging <coughs> cases. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, there's not much challenging cases in sclerotherapy other than learning how to do it. And uh, those of you that are looking for new skills in sclerotherapy or phlebectomy, we have a hands-on course every three to four months where we have uh, lots of volunteer patients that want to get treated, and uh, you're welcome to uh, visit uh, www.veinshandson.com. It's uh, doing some work on, on the website, but it should be up again in a week. But um, instead of going into specific uh, cases, I want to treat, I want to address two cases that you'll see frequently in your office. And uh, you ask yourself what to do. And uh, the first case is a 48-year-old woman with a CPA6, uh, has an ulcer, and uh, has a history of GSV stripping, um, and a history of PFO. She has no CVA, no TIA, no migraines, no diabetes, and she's not taking any hormonal replacement therapy. And uh, she needed, she had a lot of neovascularization and a lot of perforators that needed uh, UGS. So the question was, with a patient with a history of PFO, uh, should we treat her with sclerotherapy, and what do you do in those cases? And the other case is a 28-year-old woman with a CEP1 who just for aesthetic reason wanted to have treatment and uh, was miserable with her veins uh, and uh, did not go to the beach because of the veins that she had in her legs and uh, could not, did not wear a skirt and uh, had a history of frequent migraines. So what do you do in those two cases? So you, we already went through the contraindications of sclerotherapy, and uh, the question is whether PFO should be considered 
a contraindication to it or not. As you can see, absolute contraindication, people that had anaphylactic, and then some other ones that are very being mentioned in previous uh, lectures. So now, what's a PFO? Those of you who don't remember from medical school and they're now in cardiology, is basically a remnant uh, to, uh, uh, the atrioseptin communication. And what you fear is actually uh, seeing this, a thrombus going across the atrioseptin that can cause a paradoxical emboli. And um, that's what the concern of PFO is. But when you're doing sclerotherapy, the concern is whether your sclerosin could go across systemically and cause problems. So basically, a C PFO is seen in about 27% of the population. It, its occurrence is a autosomal dominant uh, 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 inheritance, very similar to migraines, and uh, that is very associated uh, with vasoactive and uh, uh, passes through the PFO. So these are some of the associated diseases that are associated with PFO, CVAs, and TIA, peripheral embolization, decompression illness. Now, let's review the literature, and this is a literature presented by Sullivan and his group that look at 33 conse consecutive patients that were monitored by echocardiogram who were treated with sclerotherapy and uh, demonstrated that all the patients had microembolization within 15 to 45 minutes. None of them had any neurological sign, and five patients did have demonstrated PFO with right to left shunt. Um, so there was no any permanent series of neurological events. On a study by J.I. and his group, they looked at the 69 studies included, and uh, the serious event was less than 1%. Visual disturbance is 1.4%, so also a very rare event. And a um, uh, group of uh, studies uh, look at uh, 20 phlebology clinics that look at uh, uh, 18 uh, patients treated for great saphenazine, 207 for small saphenazine. You can see here that the incidence of uh, neurological events with migraines was uh, only eight patients reported. And and along with seven with visual disturbances in five of them, one TIA with complete recovery. So also in this series of patients, very little neurological problems. In a study by Gux and his group that looked at 12,000 uh, sclerotherapy sessions, uh, this is a multi-center registry, uh, 5, 000, over 5,000 treated with liquid, over 6,000 treated with foam. And you can see here that only 20 cases of visual disturbances that were all resolved, uh, 49 incidents of uh, uh, or accident uh, with, with liquid 12 and 37 with foam. Uh, so no permanent or serious uh, neurological sequela. This is an interesting case that was presented last year and actually a patient that suffered a myocardial infarction after he underwent uh, sclerotherapy and it was thought to be secondary to the sclerotherapy by vasoactive vasoconstriction uh, component. So something very rare that uh, reported. So if we look at the uh, the overall risk and complications of sclerotherapy neurologically, TIAs is less than 2%, strokes is less than 1%, and actually permanent damage are, are very well, very little recorded. But it only takes one patient for you to get a wake-up call, and, and our wake-up call was a 33-year-old anesthesiologist who wanted to have her treatment, and immediately after she had her treatment, she uh, developed a slurred speech, right side of weakness, and... Um, uh, you could, everybody's adrenaline got up. It lasted about 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, fortunately, it was completely resolved. So don't be surprised when you see it also in, um, in your office. Now, some of the predictors, suggested predictors are pathogenic PFO. It's a patient that had crystogenic stroke in the, pa in the past, a uh, young age, prior immobility, like long airplane travels, uh, patients that have uh, Valsalva at onset, and uh, also other associated features with uh, pathogenic PFO are those that have atrial septal aneurysm or shunt at rest. So uh, there was a good um, a group of neurologists uh, uh, put together uh, some, uh, uh, a study of the risk of paradoxical emboli. This was presented in March in San Francisco. And they were trying to determine the variables that could uh, show what's a pathological PFO. And basically, uh, they came up with this score where they gave a maximum score of 10 and uh, let's score a zero. And these were the risk factors that they actually looked at, hypertension, diabetes, prior strokes, current smoker, absence of visible cortical infarct. And they also gave uh, scores of uh, depending on the age that the patients have. And what's interesting here, as you can see, is that if you had a score of 9 to 10, uh, the chances of you having a cryptogenic stroke from, from PFO was 73%. So these were very good variables to take into account when you're looking at, uh, at your patients what uh, the risk factor. Now, migraine is another condition that we're concerned about when we're going to treat for sclerotherapy. Actually, migraine is more, ca more common than asthma and diabetes combined in the population. And uh, 
it, it, some, some, there's some suggestion that migraines may be associated with, with uh, PFO, and especially when they have aura with it. So the complexity of paradoxical emboli can be because of anatomical variants, genetic modifiers, associated disease, nutritional status, infections, environmentals, mutations, or multifactorial. Patients that have COPD, pulmonary hypertension, or right atrial pressures or, or can, can be a high risk for it. Patients that have atrial septal aneurysm with PFOs. Patients that have the stake involved that, uh, that are pointing actually towards the, uh, the atrial septum uh, can also be an indication of pathogenic uh, PFO. Or those that have hypercoagulable states, such as protein S and C deficient, factor latum, and some of the other uh, uh, coagulation disorders that you can encounter in your population. Uh, this is a, the stroke console guideline for AHA on patients with uh, they're taking hormonal replacement. Actually, uh, you, you should not have them on them. So if you're going to treat a patient with sclerotherapy and you're concerned about uh, PF4 or embolic uh, uh, event, uh, you probably want to consider not having them taken to HR. Very rare pulmonary artery malformation is also associated with right to left shunt. Now, so what do we do? Do we do an extensive workup on every patient that's going to come to our office? We're going to do an echo, blood test, and all that? Impossible to do. So, uh, and, and I don't think it's necessary that you need to do, but you should get a very good history on your patient and find out um, whether they have any hypercoagulable state or if they had any previous event, TIA or CVA. And, uh, and just, uh, I think a good history would be sufficient and no need to do an extensive workup. So not all PFO or associated with stroke. So uh, the clinical consideration that you have to have is that sclerotherapy is actually a fairly safe procedure you need to obtain a thorough history. Be prepared for the events when patients have a plan, in, uh, a plan to, uh, to follow up in case there are complications. In patients with questionable history uh, and uh, at risk, order an echocardiogram. And those that those at high risk, then consider a different type of, of interventions that, um, for, for the individual. So what did we do with a 47-year-old lady with a, with a actually CEP6 and uh, known PFO? Um, we actually told her that, uh, that there was a higher risk and that we did uh, treated her and uh, she did very well, did not have any problem and actually her ulcer got significantly better after she was treated. With a 28-year-old lady, we suggested an echo. Of course, uh, she was uh, self-paid, did not want to pay for an echocardiogram. However, we did explain to her that on patients that have migraines, there may be a higher risk of having a neurological event. Uh, we did it, we treated her very well. We documented in the consent. I recommend that you document these in your consent, and she also uh, did uh, very well. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Javier. Next presentation by Dr. Ziller. Hey, Dr. Ziller. <laughs> about incom incompetent perforators, ultrasonic examination, and when to treat. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you very much. And uh, for my third and final presentation at this Venus tract, I've been asked to talk about uh, perforators, how we examine them, and when we treat them. So you're all familiar with the perforating veins. These are these small veins that uh, connect the uh, superficial and deep venous systems in the lower extremity, and uh, they're called perforators because they perforate the deep fascia. And normal flow in most perforators is in one direction from superficial to deep, but, but their physiology is a little more uh, complex than that. And they're not to be confused with the communicating veins, which connect veins within the same system or the same compartment. The most important perforating veins in the lower extremity are the medial calf perforators, these can be broken down into the posterior tibial perforating veins or the cocket perforators that connect the posterior accessory great saphenous vein uh, or the posterior arch vein to the posterior tibial veins and the paratibial perforators which connect the main great saphenous vein to the main trunk of the, uh, or rather the main trunk of the great saphenous vein to the posterior tibial vein. And there are also perforators up in the femoral canal uh, in the distal thigh which connect the great saphenous vein to the femoral vein. And just some anatomic diagrams, uh, those are the, the uh, uh, medial calf perforators there, and then the, the paratibial perforators, as you can see, and then there's some lateral calf, or those are the femoral perforators, and then the lateral calf perforators. So uh, 
a number of different sets of these. And a slightly different diagram showing some of the same things. Again, the, uh, the upper, middle, and lower uh, posterior tibial perforators and showing the uh, superficial and deep compartments. And again, the paratibial perforators as you see them there. Uh, I know you can't read these slides, but these are two uh, tables from two different references on terminology, and they describe the terminology used to talk about perforating veins, and they were published in, in one year apart, uh, and there are even some authors that are the same on both papers, but, but what struck me is that they're a little bit different, and so terminology in the venous system, as many of you know, is kind of a moving target. Uh, those describe the... Um, thigh perforators uh, in the 2004 paper and in the uh, 2005 paper the thigh perforator uh, terminology is a little more complicated or a little more uh, extensive. So uh, just a, a sort of a, a editorial comment on terminology there. As I mentioned a minute ago, normal flow in most of the perforators is normally uh, or normal flow in most perforators is from superficial to deep and we, we've generally accepted that as, as the, uh, the physiological fact. And so if flow is from uh, deep to superficial or outward, that would be reflux flow or abnormal. Although, as you'll see, uh, sometimes there's bidirectional flow and, and uh, it's not always that simple. Uh, the uh, perforator veins are like pressure relief valves. The abnormal high deep venous pressure can be transmitted out to the superficial tissues in the subcutaneous compartment and this gives rise to, to many of the signs and symptoms that we identify with chronic venous insufficiency, including varicose veins, skin changes, and, and ultimately ulceration. Uh, anatomic studies have shown that valves are present only in the larger perforators, and the smaller perforators, those that are less than about one millimeter in size, do not have valves, and therefore they may have uh, bidirectional flow and uh, flow can vary with the, with the physiological conditions. But in general, net outward flow is considered to be reflux. So what we, what we really uh, want to think about is not so much whether there's reflux or no reflux, because that can be difficult to determine at times, but whether the perforator is pathologic. And uh, post uh, perforator reflux increases with vein diameter. So if the vein diameter is greater than or equal to 3.5 millimeters, this is associated with reflux in 90% of the cases, so large perforators equal reflux. And in the uh, SVS, AVF clinical guidelines, uh, the uh, conditions that correspond to a pathologic perforator vein is reflux flow of greater than 500 milliseconds, although some uh, papers have advocated the use of a 350 millisecond uh, threshold. The diameter greater than or equal to 3.5 millimeters, which I just mentioned, and also immediate proximity to a healed or open ulcer bed, which would correspond to a C5, C6 uh, classification. So how do we uh, image these veins? Duplex scanning uh, is best done for perforating veins in a transverse approach, and we really just focus on the fascial boundary and look for a break or a gap in the fascia that uh, would be the location of a perforating vein. And when these are found, the exact location should be described usually by measuring the distance from a fixed anatomical point, such as the medial malleolus, and of course they can be marked on the skin for, uh, for treatment. So uh, as I said, the normal flow direction is usually from superficial to deep, and I find that the best way to, to demonstrate direction of flow is uh, with real-time color flow imaging, because uh, if you remember how the images are set up, that, that color bar uh, in the left-hand image uh, shows blue flow going uh, away from the transducer, so you see a blue streak there, and that would be flow in the normal direction from superficial to deep. On uh, the right-hand Im hand image shows the uh, diameter measurement of a perforating vein, and in this case, an enlarged perforator of 4.1 millimeters, which was located 17 centimeters above the medium malleolus. And uh, a couple other examples of color flow imaging uh, to determine direction. The top image is a, a normal, uh, uh, blue vein that's going uh, with flow going away from the transducer from superficial to deep. And then the, the bottom, you can see this somewhat tortuous perforator with, with red flow that's going uh, up, toward the, uh, up toward the skin. So treatment of perforating veins. Uh, it's interesting to note that correction of superficial venous incompetence can result in eliminating, elimination rather of perforating vein reflux. 
And this is a summary of a study in which 100 patients with 169 incompetent perforator veins underwent uh, saphenous vein ablation and then were evaluated three days after the procedure. And following ablation, only about a third of the perforators that were incompetent prior to surgery remained incompetent. In other words, two-thirds uh, uh, became competent. So reversal of incompetence uh, was si size dependent with about 90% of the small perforators uh, becoming competent, but only about 30% of the larger perforators becoming uh, competent post-procedure. So uh, the size is predictive of uh, uh, the outcome. And this, this is a table from the uh, Society for Vascular Surgery American Venus Forum clinical guidelines that I referred to a little bit earlier. And uh, uh, my eyes aren't good enough to read that on the screen for you, but basically uh, they recommended against uh, selective treatment of incompetent perforating veins uh, in patients with uh, simple varicose veins. Those are the, the C, C2 class. Um, then they suggested treatment of the pathologic perforators, which I already described for you, which were the ones that are uh, with reflex greater than 500 milliseconds, uh, diameters greater than three and a half millimeters, and those that were located uh, near uh, healed or open ulcer beds. And then for the actual uh, method of treatment, uh, they, they didn't commit to any particular uh, form of treatment, but they, they uh, stated that, that uh, approaches like uh, uh, subfascial endoscopic perforating vein surgery, uh, ultrasound-guided sclerotherapy, and thermal ablation were all appropriate depending on the clinical circumstances. So in summary, perforating veins in the lower extremity connect the superficial and deep venous systems. As we talked about, the most important ones are the medial calf perforators, which include uh, the posterior tibial perforating veins and the paratibial perforators. Uh, the abnormal high deep venous pressure is transmitted outward to the subcutaneous tissues through the incompetent perforating veins, which is the physiology of, uh, of chronic venous insufficiency. Uh, perforator incompetence or reflux is directly proportional to perforating vein diameter. Perforator size and flow direction can be assessed readily by duplex, and uh, the SBS AVF guidelines define the pathologic perforators according to the parameters that we talked about, and treatment options include SEPs, ablation techniques, and ultrasound guided sclerotherapy. So, thank you very much. Our last Presentation, The Future of Non-Thermal Venous Closure by Dr. Andrew Pop. Thank you. Hi. So um, when I was uh, assigned uh, this talk, I uh, looked at a lot of uh, literature, and uh, there's a tremendous amount of things that have been done that are being done, some thermal, some non-thermal, uh, and I'm going to touch on a bunch of them. Uh, this is what I would like from an ideal uh, ablation method. I would like it to be ad adaptable to a wide, wide variety of vein sizes. I would like it to be able to deal with tortuosity. I would like the veins to go away, not to indurate and hurt and cause problems down the road. I would like to have low risk to the structures Im immediately surrounding the veins, and here we're talking mainly nerves and skin, and I would like uh, low risk of DVT-PE. Um, I would like the treatment to be very predictable and very geographically confined, and very importantly, I would like it to be cheap because cost is more and more of a problem. So uh, these are some of the things that are around. Some of them are um, uh, thermal, some of them are non-thermal, and uh, we're going to touch uh, briefly on uh, most of them. So. Uh, the foam sclerotherapy, it's been uh, talked about a lot. Uh, there's no need of, of uh, tumescence. Uh, you don't have issues if the vein is tortuous. The foam uh, glows, goes through the tortuosities. I use it extensively in uh, patients with venous ulcers, um, and uh, it works great. Uh, there is a risk of DVT, there is a risk of stroke, and there is a risk if you extravasate or you uh, inject uh, intraarterially. Uh, the cyanoacrylate ad adhesives, uh, the company is, uh, and the product is Venacil Safion, um, it's basically super glue. Uh, and uh, you don't need to mescence, uh, you don't uh, need post-procedural compression, which is uh, an issue for many of our patients. 
uh, you don't really have capital expenses. You don't have a generator uh, or any other uh, specific equipment besides the ultrasound. And uh, literature, initial literature suggests up to 93% closure rate at one year. Uh, it has CE Mark and Health Canada uh, approval, but it's not approved by the FDA yet. Uh, it carries a risk of PE and phlebitis. And um, there is a US study that's uh, uh, expected to, be, to have been fully enrolled by 2013 uh, that hasn't uh, uh, been reported fully yet. Uh, Clarivane, uh, they, uh, they are already on the U.S. market. Uh, you in inject a sclerosant together with uh, mechanical irritation of the vein. You don't need to mesense, uh, which is a great thing because uh, in many cases I find patients have more, more discomfort from the, from the tumescence than from the procedure itself. There is no risk of nerve or skin damage. There's less steps, there's minimal bruising, and it's a four French catheter. Um, the, uh, this is what the uh, device looks like. Basically, you have this little uh, wire that uh, irritates the inside of the vein, and then uh, you uh, inject uh, the sclerosant at the same time. Uh, there are uh, several clinical trials that have been uh, reported. Uh, they're in the re literature, seems to work well. So uh, this is one uh, modality that's already here. Uh, Laser-assisted foam sclerotherapy. This is uh, obviously a partially thermal method. You use a different type of laser than the one that we're used to. You shrink the vein a bit before you inject polydecanol. The advantage is that uh, when you do this vein shrinkage, you're not really causing spasm. The vein actually shrinks, and uh, they have very interesting pictures that show that the vein shrinks without endothelial damage, uh, and then you apply the polydecanol. Uh, one of the interesting things is that they, they think it will work uh, very well for very large veins because you shrink them before you inject the sclerosant. And there's been one small clinical series uh, published as far as I'm aware. Steam ablation. This is a technology out of France. Uh, basically a very, very small and very flexible catheter, uh, as you can see, less than four French. Uh, and uh, their hope is that they'll be able to address uh, very superficial and very torturous branches. They inject steam at 120 degrees uh, Celsius, and there's no sheath. Uh, you do have to use tumescence. There's only one single arm study of 75 patients, uh, and it's not in the US yet. And this is what it looks like. Um, now, this is a old technique. Uh, our surgical colleagues uh, are probably uh, much more familiar with this. Uh, basically, this is a pretty complex way of identifying the way that the veins connect and the blood flows and trying to eliminate those connections while maintaining as much as possible of the uh, um, uh, vein itself. Um, you know, I was thinking of this after I made a presentation the other day. I had a 20-something-year-old guy uh, with an extremely strong family history of premature coronary artery disease. Obviously, that's not somebody whose veins I would like to take out, so uh, this would be a, a consideration for somebody like that. Um, the, uh, there's the traditional surgical uh, method, and there's alternative methods that have been uh, developed uh, that are endovascular. Uh, basically, this is a schematic of a simple case uh, with uh, several interventions uh, where you interrupt the veins and you reestablish flow in new patterns. Um, Invagination stripping has been around for a long time, first described in 1905, uh, and uh, it's uh, still a, me a method that can be used. Uh, you basically attach the vein uh, to a catheter and you, you, you invaginate it and you externalize it. V-block, another uh, interesting uh, technology out of Israel. Uh, basically, you put in a vascular plug and then you sclerose uh, the vein, and the vascular plug uh, is supposed to keep the sclerosant from uh, going places you don't want it to go. Uh, it's very far from clinical availability at this point. Uh, Verithena, uh, polydecanol endovenous microfoam. Uh, it's basically a fancy way of making very predictable uh, bubbles in your foam. Uh, those of you in the cardiology field uh, are familiar with the uh, contrast agents that we use uh, for uh, uh, imaging of left-sided heart chambers. This is si similar technology, basically 
uh, you you know on the left side on the uh, pink color picture there you see the varifena having the very uh, predictable size bubbles uh, and on the right side you see the bubbles uh, created by uh, manual mixture and on the right side in blue you see the same thing uh, under a microscope so uh, this is what we started with uh, none of the uh, methods that are presented cover all of these uh, points but I think we're definitely making progress into moving towards better uh, techniques um, and uh, in the end the proof will be in the pudding thank you very much Dr. Pop, I think we are far ahead of our time, so we have enough time for questions and comments from the audience. If someone wants to ask anything to our experts here, we are more than happy to address. Any questions? Does anybody want coffee? I'd like to ask a question of the, uh, the entire room, just to see uh, if anyone has used successfully or unsuccessfully uh, closure devices in veins, in popliteal veins or femoral veins or jugular veins, uh, any place that, has anyone ever placed one of those of any sort? It's a, it's a different question, but I just want to ask if anyone's ever done that or has it never been done to your knowledge? As in vascular closure devices to, to seal the, to stop yeah. the bleeding after yeah. you put or, a catheter or in? Or use the, the Astera, new, the new system. Well, if anybody's used any of those with veins. People have used uh, angioseal, people have used perclose. Um, one technique that I actually used yesterday morning is the so-called figure of eight stitch that uh, is used quite extensively by, I think, interventional radiology and by nephrology. Uh, basically, you, you make a, a figure of eight stitch around the vein and you use the skin to kind of bun bunch up the skin and compress the, uh, uh, the uh, access site. Uh, you then remove the stitch a uh, couple of hours later. There's a couple of publications in the cardiology literature from uh, Ted Feldman and his group. Uh, he uses it for the really big uh, sheets for, um, uh, you know, structural heart disease procedures. And it, it works great. Uh, use zero silk and uh, bunch up the skin, and it's very easy. Uh, I, I use it femoral. Uh, I'm sure you can use it jugular as well. I've, I've used the Minx vascular closure device for femoral vein access. Um, for large structural cases, uh, we use the seven French device even for up to 12 French access in the femoral vein. Why? <laughs> um, I, I don't think you absolutely need to. They're fully anticoagulated when we do the structural heart procedures and uh, they're large bore. Uh, you could do manual compression, obviously, but uh, it's just convenience. Anybody else? Any other questions? So uh, I want to thank you, everyone to be here this afternoon. So we will have this break and the next section will start at 325. Thank you very much. <laughs>